differentiate some of the different types of heart failure and uh, give you um, an approach to uh, treating the patient with heart failure. So here are my disclosures. You all can hear me in the back? Good, okay. So the objectives are to understand the epidemiology of heart failure, including its prevalence, increases with age, and the ethnic disparities, to describe the appropriate workup for patients with symptomatic heart failure, including when and how to use brain natriuretic peptide and pro-BNP and terminal pro-BNP, to recognize the different treatments for those with heart failure, including the lack of evidence for those with HEFPEF or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction versus the tremendous uh, body of evidence for outcome improvement with HEFREF, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And I'll talk about some of the newer treatments for heart failure with reduced EF, including uh, Entresto or LCC-696, a combination of an ARB and a um, uh, Secuputril, which is a um, basal peptidase inhibitor, um, a neprolescin inhibitor, and Evabridine. Eva we'll talk about that as well. Okay. So just with your little clicker, how confident um, are you in the evaluation and management of patients with heart failure? From not at all confident to very confident, please answer now, A through E. Okay, so, very good, interesting. Glad I picked the topic. Okay, hopefully this can change by the end of the talk. Okay, so here's the first case, and we'll use some cases to drive home some clinical points. A 58-year-old African-American woman for follow-up visit. She has a history of a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy and hypertension. She frequently has to rest during her daily housewife, housework due to shortness of breath, she has one pillow orthopnea, and she was hospitalized six months ago for heart failure. She has no history of coronary disease. An echo six months ago showed a dilated left ventricle and an EF of 30%. Currently, she's on Valsartan 160 once a day, carvacrosamide 40 twice a day, and um, she's on the Valsartan because she had a cough to enalapril. Physical examination reveals a blood pressure 125 over 80, pulse 68, Weight's 255. Uh, she has no JVD. Her lungs are clear. Cardiac regular rate, grade 2 over 6 systolic murmur. Abdomen is soft and non-tender, and her extremities reveal 1 plus edema. So she has New York Heart Association class 3 heart failure with reduced EF, and she's moderately symptomatic. She was recently hospitalized due to heart failure, and during this follow-up visit, we need to evaluate for ongoing or new symptoms, to optimize her evidence-based therapies to improve symptoms as they continue, and to reduce her chance of needing hospitalization and her improvement in survival to decrease her mortality. So first, when you look at the epidemiology of heart failure in the United States, uh, about 5.8 million patients or people uh, in the United States suffer from heart failure, and 23 million worldwide. This is from the most recent paper I can find, 2015. As of 2012, about 2.4% of the U.S. population was reported to have heart failure. So that's more than um, one in 50 adults. The number with heart failure is estimated to surpass 10 million by 2037. It's the leading cause for inpatient hospitalization in the United States, and clearly it's on the radar of the metric mavens who are looking to, re to reduce the uh, risk of rehospitalization within 30 days of discharge. The total cost of heart failure is projected to grow from $44.6 billion in 2015 to $97 billion by 2030, with 53% of the cost due to hospitalization, and it has a terrible prognosis. About 20% of patients with heart failure die within the first year of the diagnosis, while 50% of patients die within five years of the diagnosis, and if you have class 4 heart failure, 35% die within the first year after diagnosis. So it's increasing in prevalence. It's a very serious disease. It's one that costs us a lot of money. And it's one, especially when the ejection fraction is reduced, that we can do something and a lot about to change the natural history. When you look at the prevalence of heart failure, you see that about one in eight women and one in seven men um, who are octogenarians or older 
have had a diagnosis of clinical heart failure. So clearly it increases with age, and men always are at greater risk for heart failure than women. When you look at the ethnicities, you can see that um, this um, recent publication, uh, projecting up to 2030, show that blacks are always at greater risk for heart failure, clinical heart failure, than whites, than other ethnicities, and than Hispanics. And blacks are always uh, more likely to have heart failure than whites, mostly due to their greater prevalence of hypertension and the fact that they often have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So in 2013, we had the most recent heart failure guidelines. And this is the reference. Clyde Yancey was the first author of many authors on this paper. And it's a tremendous paper that I'm going to summarize for you as we go through clinical heart failure. In terms of hypertension, hypertension may be the single most important modifiable risk factor for heart failure in the United States. Hypertensive men and women have substantially greater risk for developing heart failure than normal tensive men and women. In fact, many patients that we see with uncontrolled hypertension will have evidence of preserved ejection fraction or diastolic abnormality if they were to have an echo, but many of them won't have an echo, and of course, they may not present to us years later with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, having passed through a phase of so-called diastolic heart failure, although they never presented with clinical signs and symptoms of heart failure. So as I talk about the natural history of heart failure with hypertension, one needs to remember that we often don't recognize this phase of their disease because it's not till later that they actually present with us with clinical heart failure, to us with clinical heart failure. So in our patient, clinical pearl number two, the patient has symptoms of heart failure. She had a recent echo during the hospitalization, which revealed a reduced ejection fraction. So Heart failure with reduced EF, and that is by definition usually less than or equal to 35%, going up to 40%, as opposed to heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, in which the ejection fraction may be 70 or 80%, and yet they present with clinical signs and symptoms of heart failure, although by definition we accept 50% or greater as being compatible with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And the evidence base, as I'll show you, is tremendously different between reduced EF, where we have tremendous evidence, and preserved EF, where we have almost no evidence for improving outcome. We treat the signs and symptoms. We try to prevent HEFPEF from ever occurring as primary care clinicians, recognizing the risk factors. But we really have not been able to show in any clinical trial, compared to placebo, that there's a therapy that we can sink our teeth into that will change the natural history of the disease. So let's define heart failure. It's a complex clinical syndrome that can result from any structural or functional cardiac dis disorder that either impairs the ability of the ventricle to fill where there's an inordinate pressure to amount of volume in the heart to fill or to eject blood. So in the filling phase, that usually goes along with diastolic abnormalities because the heart fills in diastole compared to ejection or systole when the heart eject, ejects blood. But clinicians cannot differentiate between preserved and reduced EF in an emergency room just by the signs and symptoms other than an S3 is more likely with reduced EF and S4 with preserved. A dilated heart is more likely with reduced EF and a narrow heart with preserved. But edema, JVD, all these other signs and symptoms of heart failure, you cannot use to differentiate these two forms of heart failure. So clearly, an echocardiogram is necessary when a patient has dyspnea, when a patient has unexplained edema, when a patient has exercise intolerance. And we cannot say just because you're overweight or you're deconditioned, we have to make sure that we have a good understanding of why patients are dyspneic, why patients have a change in their exercise tolerance, et cetera. Okay. The pathology may affect heart size, we talked about that, wall thickness, we'll talk about that, and ejection fraction. Okay, clinical heart failure. In terms of clinical heart failure, we have four stages. Stage A, this is when patients have risk factors and a high risk of developing heart failure. We see them in our practice, but they do not have any clinical signs and symptoms that would allow us to know that they have heart failure. 
because they're stage A, at risk without structural or clinical signs and symptoms. And you see these patients with hypertension or diabetes or alcohol abuse or a family history of a cardiomyopathy. Stage B, evidence of structural changes in the heart but without signs or symptoms. So they've had an MI, they have an echo, they have regional wall motion abnormality, okay, but they're still asymptomatic. They feel great. They don't have any signs and symptoms of heart failure. Or they've had hypertension for a long time and they have LVH on their EKG. So they have structural abnormalities, a thickened, hypertrophied heart, but they still have no signs and symptoms of heart failure. Stage C is where we're really right into the evidence base for reduced EF. They have signs and symptoms of heart failure. We're attuned to that. We work them up. They have a reduced EF, and we're off to the races in what we can do for them. And then stage D, which I will not talk about, is when you're using left ventricular assist devices, when they're in and out of the emergency room, when they're on the transplant list, et cetera, when they have refractory symptoms despite the best evidence-based care we can give them. And that's usually with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Because even if you've had preserved at one point, you will pass through that phase and when you need these devices and when you're at the end stage of your disease, it's almost always with a reduced ejection fraction. So what are the mechanisms? Well, on the far left are all the risk factors, including hypertension. Look, we're going to concentrate now on heart failure with reduced EF. And let's just say the patient has underlying atherosclerotic coronary disease. They presented with an MI. You get an echo, and they have an ejection fraction of 25 or 30 percent. They may be in stage A, okay, but now they could be in stage B with the MI, but let's say their echo, let's say they have no signs and symptoms of heart failure, okay, or they are in stage C with signs and symptoms of heart failure. And this is just typical of what is representative of what we're talking about. In the middle is a normal heart with a normal intraventricular cavitary uh, size, no hypertrophy of the heart, on the far left is a classic hypertensive patient with long-standing left ventricular hypertrophy, on history, poorly controlled for the most part over their lifetime, on and off medication, non-adherent. They have a very thickened concentric hypertrophied heart, a very small interventricular cavity, and we'll talk about why they also present with signs and symptoms of heart failure. On the far right is a patient that has a thin-walled, dilated cardiomyopathy, idiopathic, has an ejection fraction of 20%, and this is a patient presenting like the patient on the far left, but here they have signs and symptoms of heart failure with a reduced EF. In terms of what's going on when patients present with signs and symptoms of heart failure, there is a um, stimulation and an associated neurohormonal milieu that gets put into play that actually is initially protective but deleterious in the long run. And the biggest neurohormonal systems are the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, the sympathetic nervous system on the far left, and the fact that nitric oxide upregulation is decreased. And Dr. Strange already talked about that in pulmonary arterial hypertension. And here we're talking about systemic heart failure. So this is why on the far left, and I'll show you, we have evidence for the use of beta blockers. Many of us in med school might have been taught beta blockers were contraindicated in heart failure. Now, of course, they're very protective and improve longevity. The renin-angiotensin blockers, such as the ACE inhibitors and the ARBs. The mineralocorticoid receptor blockers, the aldosterone antagonists. And these are really the drugs we use in our patients with heart failure with reduced EF. I'll talk a little bit about isosorbide hydralazine um, and um, um, the combination of those two drugs, especially in the African American. That has an inappropriate diminution in their ability to generate nitric oxide through the endothelium of their blood va vasculature. In all of us, if we go out today in the cold and we need more um, um, cardiac output, we will have these systems temporarily put into play. Heart rate goes up. Renal angiotensin system is stimulated. But this is a very temporizing measure. We increase our amount of nitric oxide to vasodilate so that we can get more blood into our skeletal muscles peripherally. 
But these people have these hormonal systems put into play chronically in a deleterious manner. When patients present to us with signs and symptoms of heart failure, these are the tests that are recommended as a class one recommendation that insurance will pay for, the history and physical, the family history asking if they have a family history of a dilated cardiomyopathy, their weight and their volume status. And of course, these people, when they're discharged from the hospital, or even when you're following them chronically, need a scale at home to be able to weigh themselves. Telehealth is very active. Nurse-led telehealth, a weight, a scale is very important for these individuals to be able to tell the, the nurse their oxygen saturation, is it changed? Their blood pressure, has it changed? Their weight, has it changed? Their volume status, okay. CBC urinalysis, electrolytes, lipids, liver panel, TSH. Looking for etiologies and concomitant diseases. This is not an expensive liver panel. An electrocardiogram, a chest x-ray, a two-dimensional echo with assessment of left ventricular systolic function paid for as long as the patient has signs and symptoms that could be from clinical heart failure. A BNP or an N-terminal BNP, a one-time order to prognosticate and to understand if the patient may be presenting with clinical heart failure. We'll talk about that. And these are patients that are ambulatory with shortness of breath or an acute decompensation. So as I'll show you, we don't keep chasing BNPs. We don't spend a lot of money on lab tests unless they will change what we do for the patient. And if the patient presents to us decompensated, yes, we'll get the test. If the patient presents to us as a new patient, yes, we'll get the test, because it's not only helpful in the diagnosis, it's also helpful in the prognosis, both for preserved and reduced EF. Repeat measurement of LV function only should be done, repeat echo, when a significant change in clinical status has occurred. Okay, these are all uh, grade, grade one, class one level of evidence tests. So a 1A recommendation of use, using natriuretic peptides for the diagnosis of clinical heart failure, this is from the guideline, in ambulatory patients with dyspnea, measurement of BNP or N-terminal pro-BNP is useful to support clinical decision making regarding the diagnosis of heart failure, especially in the clinical, in the setting of clinical uncertainty. The difference between BNP and N-terminal BNP is that less than 100 BNP is considered normal, if you will, and less than 400 um, N-terminal pro-BNP. And the only reason to use N-terminal pro-BNP as opposed to BNP is that you've been using it in your practice all along. You have the patient with other measurements that have been one or the other all along or the patient is on Entresto or Sacubitril Valsartan, in which, through the feedback, BNP will be elevated and you can't use it to judge adequacy of therapy, but N-terminal BNP can be used. And that's the only time you have a dichotomy in the BNP being elevated and the N-terminal being reduced by the actions of this new drug. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So we don't keep ordering these tests. I know the house staff on rounds like to order these daily in the hospital. It's unnecessary. But it is necessary to order the test when our patients are, quote, tuned and leaving the hospital and coming back to the primary care clinician. Because if they were discharged with a BNP of 400, but in the past it was 1,200, and now they're doing as well as they can, and they represent to you in your office and the BNP is still 400, Perhaps this reason, if they've decompensated, is not from a worsening of their heart failure, but now they're more anemic, or now they have volume excess, or something else is going on, and we'll talk about that. Okay. So let's look at this as a composite. Okay. On the far left are the patients with stage A, risk factors only. Stage B, still asymptomatic but they have structural changes in the heart. This is a very difficult group of patients to identify because you cannot order tests for asymptomatic patients in the hopes of seeing an abnormality. You cannot get an echo unless the patient has dyspnea or unless the patient has some change in their clinical presentation. So stage A risk factors, stage B structural heart disease, usually post-MI, and now you've been able to see some abnormality on an echo.
Stage C are symptoms, so this is recognizable. You're working these patients up. And just to go through this, stage A and B are preventive, what primary care specialists do, stage C and D are treatment, okay? And some of this clearly we can do. If you're uncomfortable with treating these patients, you can get a consultation with a cardiologist, but we have to work together. And the more we feel comfortable in treating many of these patients, the less they have to be in and out of the cardiologist office who are very busy. So as you get comfortable in treating these patients, you can treat more and more of them um, in, your, in your office, in a primary care um, um, clinic in your, in, your, in your practice. So what is the therapy for stage A? Well, they could have hypertension, they have diabetes, they have dyslipidemia, they have obesity, they have the cardiometabolic syndrome. We're going to look at all those risk factors and do all we can to minimize that. The only drugs that really come to mind are a RAS blocker um, with some evidence, and I'm not sure there's any good evidence for one over the other. It's the treatment of hypertension. It's the control of the lipids. It's getting people to exercise and lose weight. Um, and, and statins as appropriate in a primary prevention strategy from what we talked about yesterday, depending on their age, depending on their LDL, and depending on if they're a candidate for a statin as a primary prevention strategy. Stage B, they're often post-MI, so we're going to use a beta blocker and, an, and a RAS blocker, okay? And as you know, uh, post-MI, the greatest benefit of the beta blockers and the RAS blockers are early on. As soon as they're hemodynamically stable, you can start it in the hospital. You can start it in your office. But for the most part, the beta blockers have their greatest benefit post-MI within the first year. And now the most recent recommendations say after two to three years, consider stopping the beta blocker if it was only given because the patient had an MI. Stage C, and we're going to go through this, is to control the signs and symptoms of the disease. Yes, you can use diuretic therapy, but it doesn't prolong life. But many therapies do prolong life. And these include the RAS blockers, either an ACE or an ARP, a beta blocker, and we'll talk about that, an aldo antagonist, spironolactone or a plerinone. In the African American, Hydralazine isosorbide dinitrate, perhaps before the aldo antagonist. The aldo antagonist as a fourth drug. Um, digoxin. Now, digoxin reduces hospitalization in HEFREF, reduced EF, but we, it's a much lower tier drug. You know, when I went to MCV, we had diuretics and digoxin. We had no RAS blockers. We never used a beta blocker in heart failure. Come on, perish the thought. We didn't have spironolactone in, really in the setting of heart failure that with reduced EF. In fact, the echo was just coming into vogue. So it's interesting how medicine has evolved. The evidence base has gotten rich. We can do so much more for these patients. So our patient's African-American is on Valsartan and Carvedilol. Yes, the Valsartan probably could have gone up to 160 BID, was on the Valsartan because she had a cough. The core eggs are 25 BID, and now she's still having some problems with doing her daily house, housework, her chores. So what do we do? Well, in her case, we considered using isosorbide dinitrate and hydralazine. Hydralazine is used mainly for nitrate tolerance, the isosorbide dinitrate, to upregulate nitric oxide, with which African Americans seem not to be able to do as well in heart failure trials as Caucasians. So fixed dose combination isosorbide dinitrate hydralazine should be added. It's the only evidence-based guideline treatment that is recommended at this time for patients with New York Heart Association cla class three HEFREF. Okay. So here's what the guideline says. The combination of hydralazine and isosorbide dinitrate is recommended for African Americans with New York Heart Association class three, four HEFREF on guideline directed management therapy. So they're on the beta blocker with, and, and the ACE or ARP, but not both, the ACE or ARP. 1A recommendation. A 2A with a B class, a combination, can be useful for HEFREF in those who cannot be given an ACE or an ARP. So on a beta blocker, one could consider this. This is a guideline-directed therapy that is race-specific, but many believe it can be used in non-African Americans. But when you look at all of the therapies and you look at the guideline, you've got symptomatic heart failure, you've got an ACE or an ARB and a beta blocker. If they have volume excess on the far left, 
For symptomatic therapy, you add a loop diuretic. If you use Lasix, please use it at least BID. It lasts six hours. If you use it once a day, they get paradoxical reclamation of sodium, increased sodium reclamation in the distal tubules and the collecting duct. So it actually gets rid of some volume early, but during the rest of the day, they're actively reabsorbing sodium. So if you don't use a long-acting loop diuretic, like torzomide, whatever your choice is, you have to use Lasix, BID, and sometimes TID. Okay, look in the middle. ACE or ARB beta blocker, African-American, class three or four heart failure, add class one level of evidence, hydralazine nitrate. On the other hand, further along the line, class two to four, with a GFR of greater than 30 cc's per minute and a K less than five, you could add a spironolactone or an aplerino. Okay. When you look at ACE inhibitors or ARBs, beta blockers, and I'm specifically talking about long-acting metoprolol, the succinate, not the tartrate, carvedilol, and bisoprolol, which can be given 1.25 to 10 milligrams once a day, long-acting, but used in Europe. Not FDA approved in this country, but clearly has evidence. Those three beta blockers, an aldo antagonist and hydralazine nitrate, they all reduce death. They all reduce symptoms. They all have NNTs that are phenomenal to reduce event rates, and they all reduce hospitalization. This is the New England Journal study on the African American Heart Failure Trial, or AHEFT. And the conclusion was the addition of a fixed dose of isosorbide dinitrate plus hydralazine to standard therapy for heart failure, including neurohormonal blockers, is efficacious and increases survival among black patients with advanced heart failure. The final dose was 75 TID of hydralazine and 40 TID of isosorbide dinitrate. So although it comes as a fixed dose combination, if you want to use generic medicines, you can use hydralazine. 325 milligrams three times a day with ISMO three times a day or with uh, isosorbide dinitrate three times a day. Okay, ISMO actually you could use less than that because it's long acting. Okay. This is the AHEF trial studied only in self-identified African Americans with class three or four heart failure for at least three months. The EF was reduced. They were on standard good background therapy. And here's the background of therapy. So you're seeing an African American on a diuretic an ACE or an ARB, a beta blocker, maybe DIG, and maybe a mineralocorticoid receptor blocker, and they're still symptomatic, class three heart failure. Double blindly, you up titrate three times a day to give isosorbide dinitrate hydralazine or placebo, and you follow them. Stopped short because the Data Monitoring Safety Board saw that those African Americans on active therapy, on top of that background of therapy, were dying less frequently. Not only that, but they had less hospitalization in the middle, and they had a better functional status by the quality of life function um, score that we use in heart failure. A triple win in this study. How many of you, just by a show of hands, use isosorbide dinitrate and hydralazine in patients with heart failure? Okay, okay. So, she was initiated f due to the AHEV trial on a fixed-dose combination of isosorbide 20, hydralazine 37.5. That's what it comes in as a trade name product, not yet generic. Three times a day. After four weeks, she was up titrated to two tablets three times a day. And then she's on the final dose of 120, 225, isosorbide dinitrate hydralazine. Hydralazine is mainly given, even though it's a vasodilator, for the nitrate tolerance that occurs with chronic continuous nitrate therapy. Let's shift a little bit. We've talked about ACEs or ARBs, beta blockers, isosorbide dinitrate, especially in the African American. Perhaps in the Caucasian, you'll go first with a mineralocorticoid receptor blocker. Let's shift to the most recent FDA-approved medication, and that is based on this paradigm heart failure trial. This was an industry-supported, largest-ever heart failure, five-year systolic reduced EF heart failure trial with patients with New York Heart Association class two to four heart failure. They had to have ejection fractions no greater than 40%, over 8,000, average age 64, throughout the world, 47 countries. And they double-blindly compared the ACE inhibitor enalapril given at 10 milligrams BID with this 
ARB neprolescin inhibitor called LCC696, which now has been named Entresto. And it's brought to us by Novartis. It comes in several dose strengths, but the dose of 200 BID was the ceiling dose used. We'll talk about that. It was stopped early, the trial, with a median follow-up of two plus years because the primary composite outcome of cardiovascular death or first hospitalization for heart failure were reduced by 20%. If we were to do this trial 1,000 times, uh, excuse me, 10,000 times, it would come out the same, 9,999, and an improved quality of life. Drug discontinuation was less in the LCZ group, but you must know that these patients had to tolerate both an ACE inhibitor and this drug, LCC696, in a run-in period before they were eligible for the trial. So they made sure that these people could stay on the medication through the run-in period, but yet, once they were tolerant of the, uh, tolerated the drug, we compared the two arms of the study. And this was published, you know, last year, 2014, um, what, about uh, 14 months, 15 months ago. <clears throat> This is a landmark trial, and here's how it works. LCZ-696 is made up of <clears throat> the neprolescin inhibitor, Sacubutrel, LPQ-657, which inhibits or blocks neprolescin. And by doing so, um, it, it also includes valsartan, the ARB. Now, by blocking the uh, vasoconstriction and the a AT1 receptor, it decreases blood pressure, sympathetic nervous system tone, mineralocorticoid receptor activity, fibrosis, and hypertrophy of the vasculature in the heart. And on the left-hand side of the, so of the slide, by blocking ANP and BNP, that is, it's a neprolescin inhibitor, it decreases blood pressure, also decreases sympathetic tone, aldo levels, fibrosis, hypertrophy. And it's also natriuretic and diuretic, okay, because in, in doing so. Okay, so here are the curves. Primary outcome, cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization, a 20% reduction, 0 0.80 hazard ratio. Look at that p-value. I mean, it's just ridiculous to show it that much, but clearly they were trying to show us how significant it was. The drug comes in three strengths, 2426, 4951, and 97103, and that was the ceiling dose given BID. To reduce the risk of death and hospitalization for heart failure in patients with two to four class heart failure with reduced DF. That's the FDA indication. It should not be given in those with a history of angioedema from an ACE or an ARB, because it's likely to cause that if you use this drug. It should not be given with concomitant ACE inhibitor or aliscarin, because it has an ARB, and we do not use ACEs and ARBs or aliscarin in an ARB or aliscarin in, in, with an ACE in our primary care patients, even with heart failure. You're gonna start with the 4951 twice a day dose if they're on an ACE or an ARB, and after two to four weeks, you're gonna up titrate to the 97103 twice a day. That's the maintenance dose. If they're not on an ACE or an ARB, that is they're virgin and you wanna start this drug, or they're on lower doses than the 10 BID of enalapril or a comparator within the ACE or ARB class. If they have an estimated GFR of less than 30 or child's pub hepatic impairment, you're going to start, and only in these cases, start with the lowest dose of the medicine and use that for two to four weeks and then go to the moderate dose and then two to four weeks later go to the high dose. Otherwise, you start at the 4951. If you switch from lisinopril 40 to this drug, you're going to allow a 36-hour washout between the two drugs, okay? And um, you're going to start with the 4951. It's an ARB. It has an ARB in it. And so there's an increased risk of neonatal mortality, morbidity, in the second and third trimesters, if not the first. So you're not going to use this in a woman of childbearing age. But most people with heart failure, a woman with heart failure with reduced EF, is not about to get pregnant. That needs to be discussed. It's not recommended in nursing. It's not recommended for an adolescent patient. And it's not recommended in severe hepatic impairment. You're going to follow the creatinine, the potassium, the GFR, and you're going to look for hypotension. Have any of you had patients on this drug by a show of hands? Okay, one, a couple. Okay, it's, it's new on the block. Okay, so I just wanted to just go over that with you.
Case two, 75-year-old white woman here for follow-up. History of diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and hypertension. Has mild shortness of breath when walking from the car to the church. She's gained 15 pounds over the past year. She was hospitalized due to poorly controlled hypertension and heart failure eight months ago. No history of coronary disease. She has one pillow orthopnea. She usually does not sleep on a pillow. And she has frequent an ankle swelling. Her echo shows her EF is 70%, but she has concentric LVH and a little atrial enlargement. Currently, she's on amlodipine 5, a tenolol 50, once a day, a Torva 20, aspirin 81. Her blood pressure is 135 over 80, pulse 68, weights 285. On physical examination, her lungs are clear, no JVD, regular rate, abdomen is soft, non-tender, and she has two-plus bilateral ankle edema. She has dyspnea and edema in an older woman. She has a history of hypertension. So we're going to consider heart failure with preserved EF, EF 70%, and the need for cautious diuretic therapy and potassium supplementation. So here, as opposed to the HEFREF, our patient has concentric LVH, long-standing hypertension. On history, you found out that she really wasn't controlled for many years of her life. She's paid a price for the hypertension with a concentric LVH. And now for a given volume of fluid in her left ventricle during the rest cycle of her heart, she generates an inordinate pressure, and she has signs and symptoms of heart failure, so-called diastolic dysfunction. Women are more likely to have diastolic heart failure as opposed to those with systolic heart failure. Women are less likely than men to have coronary disease as the etiology of their heart failure. And coronary disease increases the mortality risk 2.5 times in women and only 1.5 times in men. And although we use these terms diastolic and systolic heart failure, no clinical trial has ever enrolled patients based on those terms. So for clinical purposes, we identify patients that do best on certain therapies by their ejection fraction and not by the presence or absence of diastolic heart failure. Okay. What is going on in these patients? Well, on the far right is the normal person with a normal Frank Starling curve. It's Saturday night. Jets against Dallas tonight. You're in your room. Pretzels, peanuts, potato chips, a couple of beers. You increase your volume on the Frank Starling curve, but because your heart is normal, when you get a sense that your bladder is full, you go to the bathroom, you diurese, and you go back down on the Frank Starling curve, never generating signs or symptoms of shortness of breath. On the other hand, our elderly woman with long-standing hypertension in green with concentric LVH, for a given amount of increase in left ventricular volume, she generates an inordinate pressure in her left ventricle up to the pulmonary circuit. And before you know it, like many, she's in the emergency room short of breath, with or without edema if she gets right-sided heart failure. But she feels terrible, and that's what's going on. So why do these people decompensate? Excess salt, new onset atrial fib, someone's added chronic NSAIDs or a CCB that decreases the ejection fraction like DILT or verapamil, or she's not on a diuretic, or she has worsening blood pressure control or now she's superimposed myocardial ischemia, or her kidney function's gotten worse, or we've added too much volume, or she's now got a decrease in oxygen carrying capacity because she has new onset anemia. So these are some of the things to think about in these patients. But she's on the far left, and unfortunately, there's not a scintilla of evidence other than getting her volume reduced and treating her risk factors that a particular therapy will improve her outcome. So we really have to control her blood pressure, careful diuresis to control her signs and symptoms of, of volume excess, get rid of her edema, and make her shortness of breath better. Because we will, by diuresing her, shift her down on that steep Frank Starling curve so that with a reduction in diastolic volume, she will get below that symptom horizontal line and feel better. And that's what happens to these people in the emergency room when they're sent home. So they need to know about their diet, they need to know about volume excess, and all these other things. Okay. I just want to say spironolactone has been double blind, randomly con uh, compared to placebo in patients with HEFPEF, and unfortunately in patients with heart failure and preserved EF, Spiro did not significantly reduce the incidence of the primary composite outcome of death from cardiovascular causes, causes aborted cardiac arrest, or hospitalization for the management of heart failure.
So in HEFPEF, as opposed to HEFREF, what are the recommendations in the 2013 ACC AHA guideline? Controlled blood pressure, diuretics for the relief of symptoms, coronary revask if they have ischemia. So many of these people, you clearly want to look to see if they have ischemia. You don't want them to continue to be treated and never having been looked at, either early on through a stress test or perhaps whatever has to be done, a non-invasive uh, dobumene, stress thallium, to see that they don't have ischemia. Um, but it's a lower level of evidence. If they have AFib, certainly you'll treat it. You know, often we'll use beta blockers or ACE inhibitors or ARBs for their hypertension, but it's a 2A recommendation. It's because we're treating the hypertension. And ARBs might be considered to decrease hospitalization in these patients, but it's a 2B. It doesn't harm, it might be helpful, but the evidence base is not that rich. Okay, that's what we're left with. Finally, case three, 66-year-old white male, history of coronary disease, status post-cabbage, ischemic cardiomyopathy, HEFREF, severe COPD, with frequent use of inhalers, comes to you to see you during a recent hospitalization for decompensated heart failure. Currently on metoprolol, 12.5 daily, long-acting, aspirin, atorvastatin, and albuterol inhaler. On physical examination, the blood pressure is 118 over 80, the pulse is 85, weight's 235, no JVD. Lungs has scattered wheezes, cardiac regular rate, no murmurs or gallops, abdomen soft, non-tender, and there's no edema. You get an EKG in a sinus rhythm, nonspecific STT abnormalities, and the heart rate is um, 85. So here's a patient with severe COPD, only able to tolerate low-dose metoprolol, because when you've gone up on the beta blocker, they've had an exacerbation of their COPD. And they have what looks like decompensated heart failure. So the heart rate is high, severe COPD, scattered wheezers, wheezes. So what are you going to do for this patient? OK, well, clearly you're going to get a BNP or um, a proterminal BNP to see if this is mostly COPD or a change in heart function, OK, compared to their baseline. But you have a patient that's intolerant of higher beta blocker dosage and still needs more therapy. And has a heart rate that's probably too high for their cardiac output and the maximization of their cardiac output. So here's another new drug called Evabradine, and it's approved for systolic heart failure. It's an inhibitor of the funny channel of the sinus node, that is the pacemaker lowering heart rate. It doesn't affect blood pressure or other ionic currents, and it was approved April 2015 this year for patients with, one, stable chronic heart failure with a reduced EF, FREF, normal sinus rhythm, two, a resting heart rate of at least 70 beats per minute, three, and taking beta blockers, four, at the highest dose they can tolerate. Evabradine was studied in a clinical trial not done in this country. This is the first time I know the FDA know of that the FDA has approved a drug of patients that have not been studied in this country. Nevertheless, they were on the evidence-based standard background therapy, an ACER and ARB, and aldosterone antagonist. It reduced the time to first hospitalization for worsening heart failure compared to placebo, but did not reduce overall mortality. Heart rate was lowered. Uh, heart rate lowering reduced O2 demand without affecting LV function. The most common side effects with um, evabradine um, observed in this clinical trial were bradycardia, hypertension, and that's a heart rate less than 50, hypertension, atrial fibrillation, new onset, and temporary vision disturbances, which are called phosphenes. This is the transient um, light phenomenon that patients sense for the per first several weeks to no more than one to two months when they first initiate this drug that stops with continued use. You start at 5 BID, you check the pulse. If it's at least greater than 60, you can go to the ceiling dose of 7.5 BID. If the pulse is less than 50, you can go to the third tablets. Actually, you have to use a half of a five. It comes in two tablet sizes, 2.5 BID. Should not be started in the hospital. It's only effective in those with a normal sinus rhythm. It's pricey, and it's a, a niche drug, if you will. Um, you have to monitor the pulse. It won't change the blood pressure. Uh, you want to uh, monitor a heart rhythm as one in 100 patients develop AFib. So here's the worldwide non-US study called SHIFT, systolic heart failure treatment with the IF inhibitor evabradine trial. 
Here are the baseline characteristics, mostly men, mean age 60, two-thirds ischemic heart disease, um, about 50% New York Heart Association class 2, 50% 3 and 4, more than half with a previous MI, a third diabetic, two-thirds hypertensive. Double-blindly randomized with a mean heart rate of 80, an LF, uh, left ventricular ejection fraction that's reduced. There's your blood pressure. There's your GFR. So this is the primary composite outcome. It was significantly reduced, but death was not affected, and the only thing that was benefited was hospitalization for heart failure. So I present this to, for you just to know about it. It's kind of a, a drug with a narrow use. Um, I think the pulmonologist and the cardiologist may share this drug. Certainly the cardiologist, when they can't uptitrate the beta blocker because of the severity of the COPD, um, with all the caveats that I told you about this. It does reduce heart rate. Heart rate must stay above. You'd like it to, to be above 60 if you uptitrate to the higher dose, but it can be below 60 but not less than 50 um, to, to continue its use. So. In the study, heart failure with systolic dysfunction and elevated heart rate was associated with poor outcomes. Evabradine reduced the primary endpoint, but it did so because it reduced heart failure hospitalization. The, benefit, the beneficial effect was mainly driven by this effect on hospitalization for heart failure. Overall treatment with Evabradine was safe and well tolerated, but there was more bradycardia, there was more new onset heart failure, and they will have this phenomenon called phosphenes early on that dissipates with continued use. So based on data from the shift study, this patient had evabradine added to them at 5 BID. They were followed over the next month, see what happens to their heart rate. Can they go up on the 7.5 BID? And um, since the patient was recently discharged following hospitalization for acute heart failure, it will be important to coordinate care with the cardiologist in order to determine optimum timing and dose of evabradine. I don't really see this as a primary care drug. I'm not sure if Entresto, I don't think that's a primary care drug right now, but I do think you'll see patients over time that will be on these drugs. Um, and it remains to be seen where, um, based on the paradigm study, and this drug is being studied in heart failure with preserved EF. Stay tuned, because it may improve outcome in heart failure with preserved um, EF. It, it remains to be seen where the drug will settle in terms of primary care versus specialist. So on the far left, you have the drug classes we use in clinical heart failure. In the middle, you have their mechanism of action. On the far right, you have some of the side effects. In blue are the drugs we use for quality of life, but not to reduce or improve uh, either heart failure hospitalization or to improve longevity. Um, where Entresto or the angiotensin receptor neprilescin inhibitor or ARNI fits into play is unclear. Some of the cardiologists are suggesting it can be used early before the ACE inhibitor. That remains to be seen. Clearly, it's much more expensive than the ACE inhibitor, which is a generic drug. Where evabradine fits in the paradigm is still unclear as well. And then finally, just to show you the cost of these drugs from a recent medical letter, uh, I just think it's important to know what patients pay for the medications, especially in those with HEFREF. So that's it. We're on time. We might have time for questions. What time was I supposed to be done? What? 11. 11, okay. So would you answer this question? Um, how confident are you in the evaluation and management of patients with heart failure? Please answer now. Okay, so we're shifting a little bit, but obviously I've got a lot of work to do. Okay, well, we are shifting a little bit. That's great. Okay, so this has been fun. Let's answer some questions. Yes? The normal ejection fraction is hard to define, but I would say that it's somewhere around 70 to 80, 70 percent. I would say that most of us, when we maximally fill our left ventricle, we're able to eject uh, 70 percent. 
in, in, in one fell good pump. Yeah. But we use the other determinants. 40%, some use 35% in the clinical trials for HEFREF, and at least 50% for um, HEFPEF. Let me just say, to go a little further in the rest of the story, there are patients that transiently will have HEFREF post-MI who then go through a phase of, 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 a, of a, a favorable ejection fraction. And we've seen that clinically in our patients. So just remember, today's ejection fraction may be, you know, three months from now, the ejection fraction. It may change, it may not, but sometimes, depending on the acuteness of the injury to the patient, uh, ejection fractions go through a transient period uh, and then actually um, become more favorable. Yes? You know, I, I'm not a big believer in fluid restriction. Fluid restriction to me is, is when they have hyponatremia in heart failure, uh, which is not uncommon, of course, and a poor prognostic sign. But to me, you know, that's when they need both fluid and salt restriction. Um, I, I don't think fluid restriction is a big uh, problem here. I think it's mainly salt with compensatory volume um, excess that follows it. So it's the potato chips, it's the cultural diet, it's the high salt, the processed foods that gets these people into trouble. I'm not a big believer in fluid restriction unless they're hyponatremic. I may be wrong in that, but that's how I've always approached it. Anybody uh, look at it differently? Yeah. Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, you know, I don't think there's a ceiling dose on Lasix. Um, in fact, uh, in the emergency... Well, the question is, do you think you can give up on it too quickly, though? Yes. Yes, the ceiling dose on Lasix is the dose that uh, finally got them to diurese. And in the emergency room, I mean, you look, people... Well, I think, I think orally, chronically, um, you're going to get into trouble if you have to do that. And you're going to need to use combination uh, diuretics to fool the kidney into how much salt you're going to allow it to reclaim. But um, in the emergency room, clearly, um, you double the dose of Lasix until you get a diuresis. And I don't know that there's a, really a ceiling dose. Now, you can get into trouble. But clearly, in the ambulatory setting, I like to re I mean, I see myself reducing doses of diuretics over time um, and using the other drugs that really change the natural history of the disease over time. And that's a, a, a common occurrence that I see. Yes? Don't you think that uh, maybe the onset of cardiorenal syndrome would be when you start saying maybe you yeah. reach your peak with yes. the or any new bacteria? Yes, and that's a very good point. So when you start seeing the BUN and creatinine going up and you're, you're tipped off to an abnormality between renal plasma flow and GFR based on the volume status and heart pump function, that's a tricky issue there. So just like as you'll see in the sprint trial, I mean, the kidney and the heart do work together and um, they don't always behave in the same manner. So that can be a real issue the iatrogenic volume reduction that we cause that doesn't allow the kidney, very dependent on plasma flow, to have enough blood and volume, you know, to, to a filter. So that's an issue. Yeah, you got to look at the creatinine very carefully. Yes? On the uh, utilization for new stop for our cardiac hospitals. Oh. And what, what I'm seeing from third-party payers is, a, is, a, is a, an increase, drastic increase in denial Yeah. So these people are in the emergency room. Well, they're being admitted from the office. Okay. 
Yes. Well, I think, uh, you know, I look at that, I, I think there's a, a, a you, you need to have a strong reason to admit a HEFPEF to the hospital just for volume excess. Because you can keep them in the emergency room and get them to a point where they feel much better on that Frank Starling curve. Now, HEFREF is a different situation, and then the social situation comes into it, you know, and, and there are other issues. So I think these are different diseases. Um, but. It's interesting you tell us that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a patient with a very poor prognosis, but at the same time, yes, you have to improve their oxygenation and uh, get them out of their volume excess. Yeah. Uh, 